we want to improve collagen maturation, and ultimately we want increased collagen strength. Okay, we want the tendon to be stronger, we want the ligament to be stronger. Of healing connective tissue, so this is uh, mainly gonna apply right now to tendons and ligaments, is we are looking to encourage collagen synthesis, we want to improve collagen maturation, and ultimately we want increased collagen strength. Okay, we want the tendon to be stronger, we want the ligament to be stronger. So when we break this down into what therapy we want to look at doing, we have to remember that tendons become weak when they're fibrotic, fibrotic when avascular, and avascular when inflamed. So it's trying to understand with your patient where they're at in this aspect to know how to intervene. It's reverse engineering the problem at hand. If the patient has an acute tendonitis and they're in the inflammatory stage, not in the weak degenerative fibrosis stage, that therapy is gonna be a little different than when they're in the light stage tendinosis, okay? Um, so oral hyaluronin or oral hyaluronic acid um, is one that I've seen really interesting results with and not for the reasons we expect, okay? The initial thinking with oral hyaluronic acid was, oh great, we're going to take oral hyaluronic acid, hyaluronic acid is going to go in the blood and then that is going to get incorporated into the extracellular matrix and we're going, it's like getting a Injection of hyaluronic acid in the knee does not work that way based on what we know right now. But let's look at a, a review. So this here looked at, uh, this was Japan, China, Japan, I believe Japan. There's, a, uh, there's many different types of uh, oral hyaluronic acids on the market. The one that's, pat I tend to like patented things because typically that means they've been studied and researched and there's no difference. Meaning a curcumin product that's not patented, I have no idea if that's the same curcumin in this study versus this study versus this study versus this study. If I have patented theracurmin, I know it's the same in this study, this study, this study, and this study. And so there's there, I tend to gravitate more towards that stuff, especially when we're looking at research, because you could be comparing apples to oranges when you're looking at different herbs and things like that, just because we know that plants grow differently in different climates. There's different bioactive molecules in them based on soil quality, based on water and temperature. And so it's important to have some standardization. So this is a patented product called OralVisc. OralVisc is the, the patented name that is then found in various different supplements, okay? It's, an, it's a preparation of oral hyaluronin um, that we can take orally. So <clears throat> what they found here was that between placebo and the uh, OralVisc is that patients had a reduction in their pain over a 12 month period with taking this. This was patients with uh, knee osteoarthritis, okay? Again, initially they were looking at, oh, well, osteoarthritis, low hyaluronic acid, and so they thought that was the case. However, what they actually ended up finding that what is happening is that the oral hyaluronic acid is actually creating a reduction in inflammatory cytokines in the body. It's reducing leptin levels that is then having a positive impact on obesity, inflammation, and therefore arthritis, okay? <clears throat> there was one study that uh, did look at uh, some collagen turn, or sor sorry, some chondrocyte turnover uh, in, or sorry, collagen, it was collagen, collagen turnover in the, um, in the actual cartilage, and it was improved in the patient's oral hyaluronic acid but again, it's, there's no way to actually say that that's because we incorporated hyaluronic acid into the cartilage. It's more so, I believe, that we are getting activation of toll-like receptors in the gut, 
which are going to have a reduction or cause a reduction in pro-inflammatory cytokines. We are going to increase IL-10, which re results in further reduction of pro-inflammatory cytokines, which is going to have a reduction in total systemic inflammation and therefore have benefits on a condition like arthritis. Uh, this is another study looking at uh, visual analog score of patients on oral visc versus placebo over a 12-week period. What we see is that there was a statistically significant difference at eight weeks. So based off this, what I typically tell my patients when we start this supplement is that we're doing it for eight weeks minimum because we don't know after four weeks if, it's if, you're, if they're in the camp that they get a positive response. We typically are going to wait 12, or sorry, eight weeks and more to know, okay? So in the researchers trying to figure out uh, part of why this oral visc works, one of the things that they stumbled across initially was that the oral visc appears to decrease leptin levels. We're going to talk heavily about leptin when we get into the hormone section because it is um, technically in part a hormone. But I wanted to bring it up now because we're talking about this. So leptin is an adipokine. It is made in our adipose tissue. Levels go up when we have obesity. So it, it generally correlates with BMI. So a patient with a BMI of 30 is going to have a lot more uh, leptin than the patient who has a BMI of 22, for example. <clears throat> now, there's other things that can also increase leptin levels outside of obesity. Inflammatory cytokines, TNF-alpha, and I believe IL-6, um, it's on another slide, can increase production of leptin by the adipocyte. And so we know that in patients who have better obese and inflamed, they tend to have even higher leptin levels. And clinically, I see that as well when I, when we, because we can measure leptin levels in the blood um, and correlates pretty well with that. So this study here looked at in the blood, but also in the synovial fluid, which is really, really important. Because again, if we are going to start talking about therapies that are going to impact inside the knee joint, I would like to know, does that thing actually get inside the knee joint, right? If, for example, this is just an example, because I don't know the data on curcumin, but if we want to say that curcumin is going to have an anti-inflammatory effect in, on cartilage cells, well, do we actually even know that the curcumin gets inside the synovial fluid? If you don't look at synovial fluid analysis, we don't know, okay? This also, when we know that leptin levels, for example, are found in the synovial fluid, this gives weight to research studies that look at, in a petri dish, what happens when we add leptin to chondrocytes. Because we know that in the knee joint, leptin is in contact with chondrocytes. It's still a different environment than a Petri dish, but it at least gives us some weight to try to understand that, okay? So baseline, looking at serum leptin uh, and the synovial fluid leptin. With placebo, we did not see a decrease in the leptin, right? 21, 21, 25, 27. However, with the oral visc, they saw a decrease in leptin in the synovial fluid that was statistically significant, and also a decrease in leptin levels in the um, in serum. Okay, so we saw a decrease. Clinically, I also see that when I start patients on oral visc, from whichever brand I, uh, which there's two main brands that I use, um, Zymogen and Da Vinci Labs. Um, but leptin seems to go down. Now, I don't have data on this because they didn't look at it and I haven't been able to find any research on this. 
They looked at baseline BMI, which was great, but they didn't look at post-treatment BMI. So I don't know if this reduction in leptin from oral visc was because we saw a reduction in inflammation from activation of the toll-like receptors and therefore weight loss, which then reduces systemic inflammation, or if the oral visc is having an additive benefit on top of the weight loss, okay? Because the other thing that I use oral visc for is patients who are obese or overweight and have high leptin levels, regardless if they have arthritis. Because the data just keeps showing that when you put patients on oral visc, who have high leptin, they, their leptin goes down, which helps regulate their brain gut connection between being hungry and full. And so they have better eating behaviors. Okay? We already talked about this. Just bringing it back up because, again, it's something that we think about when trying to heal connective tissue. B vitamin supplementation in patients who may have methylation defects or something that's going to impact their B vitamin status. Collagen. So another hotly debated topic on whether or not this actually, what time is it by the way? So I don't go over. Okay. Um, on whether or not collagen actually is going to impact, um, impact any form of healing. So the arguments are, the, so on two sides of the camp, the one argument is collagen gets broken down into the amino acids in the gut, so it literally doesn't matter, and taking collagen is a waste of money. The other camp is, well, actually, when collagen gets broken down, it gets broken down into proline, hydroxyproline, actual more polymers, not amino acids, so more of the actual polypeptides, and because of that, that can then increase blood levels of those polypeptides and therefore potential for healing because there's more proline and hydroxyproline floating through the blood, which can then become mature collagen. Okay, so those are the two camps. You probably know which camp I'm in because I'm talking about this. <laughs> um, all right, so here, uh, vitamin C enriched gelatin supplementation. Before intermittent activity, that's the, I think the one thing that I want to stress the most in terms of, of collagen is these lovely graphs that maybe you'll look at one day. Let's talk through them, okay? So this year looked at glycine, proline, hydroxyproline, lysine, hydroxylysine, and leucine, okay? They looked at the difference between a placebo gelatin powder, five grams of gelatin powder, and then they looked at 15 grams of gelatin powder. What they found was one, that the 15 grams was able to increase levels of our actual um, amino, the polypeptides that it gets broken down into. And interestingly, it was around, so it basically what they said was dosing it one hour before exercise is going to be beneficial in improving collagen synthesis because if you dose it here, and then you work out here when you have higher levels of glycine, hydroxyproline, and proline in your blood. When you then stress tissues through exercise, when you then do exercise that causes blood flow to go to your cartilage, for example, you then have a higher chance of these being incorporated into collagenous tissue. Okay? This year again, um, so what they looked at here was they actually did a, uh, a muscle biopsy and they looked at the amount of collagen that was actually found in the muscle biopsy based on their pre-levels, the placebo, five grams and 15 grams. 
So again, what they did, they took the biopsy, did this in a Petri dish, hence why we got you know, the test tube plus the humans. So it's human data, but again, still done in a Petri dish. And what they found was that the, and I apologize, I misspoke. What they, look, what they did, which is actually really, really cool, is they took the serum, the blood, the plasma of the patient, put that in a test tube to watch how much collagen is made. What they found was that the serum that contained the higher levels of glycine, proline, hydroxyproline, all these polypeptides and amino acids, the rate of collagen synthesis in the test tube was higher. Cool study, right? It kind of shows us that, hey, if, and again, there's an assumption there, if that plasma, that amount of peptides and amino acids, if that gets near the collagen to be made, it's likely that it's going to increase rates of collagen synthesis. Hence why doing it around exercise is going to increase the rate that that can happen because blood flow to tendons, ligaments, and cartilage increases with exercise. And so I've started having patients dose their collagen peptides before exercise. Again, it also gets patients exercising, right? When you think about it, you can tell a patient that I need you to take this collagen supplement because it's gonna help your healing of your tendons, but in order for it to really work, I need you to strength train a few times a week. Now they're like, okay, I'll do it. Still some are no, but it's another way to try and overcome the uh, objectifications that patients are going to have. Um, so the quality of your collagen supplement matters, okay? Um, there is <coughs> regular, so this one, regular placebo, the what looks like teal-ish here is our um, non enzyme degraded collagen. So this is going to be more things like gelatin supplements, not the hydrolyzed collagen supplements that most of us are probably using anyways, um, because most of those are done enzymatically, whereas the, um, the actual gelatin supplements are not done enzymatically. This study here looked at the increase in all of basically all three, they, they broke it out, but I'm just showing you the collection of all three, the glycine proline and hydroxyproline. And what they found was that there was an increase more so with the non or with the enzyme hydrolyzed collagen supplements. The way you can tell because some companies won't tell you if it's enzymatically digested or non enzymatically digested but from the research I've looked at, if it dissolves in cold water, it's been enzymatically digested. Because it, it, in order to get that level of enzymatic digestion, it, or sorry, in order to get that level of solubility in cold water, it had to have gone through an enzymatic digestion, not a non-enzymatic digestion. That's why gelatin supplements in cold water form gels, but dissolve in hot water, whereas the collagen supplements will dissolve in both. Vitamin C. I have one slide on it, just because this was actually a really great study at um, basically pulling together all the preclinical and clinical, which is very low data, um, that this, this, study, this paper was actually done decently well. This is, this is the, the gist of it. Vitamin C is needed for collagen production. So if you are at any form of cellular deficiency of vitamin C, there is a chance that collagen production is going to be decreased. We do not have any great studies. There's a few decent studies, but no great studies actually looking at Okay, if we have a patient with a rotator cuff tear and we know that they are deficient in vitamin C, 
not full scurvy, but like subclinically, and we replete that vitamin C, does their healing get better if we do a PRP procedure? We don't, we don't have that data, okay? But we have a lot of preclinical data showing us that vitamin C is really important for the wound healing process, okay? So other micronutrients that there's not a lot of great research on, but there is some research um, suggesting that it is uh, preclinically important. Things like arginine for nitric oxide inflammation, which might be beneficial for supporting a positive inflammatory response, but also some research suggesting that optimal levels of nitric oxide are beneficial for stem cells to be able to do their function. Vitamin A for proliferation, uh, different things like omega-3 fatty acids, selenium, zinc, vitamin E for uh, the anti-inflammatory effects that we see. Um, and then different things for matrix deposition. Arginine again, vitamin C, vitamin A, uh, glutamine, things like that. So different things to just consider and I'm putting these up here so that way one day if you're ever looking back and you're scratching your head at a case and a patient's not healing and you're like, oh wait, vitamin A might be really beneficial for this patient because their, their night blindness is really bad, they don't eat any organ meats, they're not supplementing, like th there's just things that line up clinically to what seem like could be a subclinical deficiency and then you're like, oh, maybe that could be beneficial. Um, so I included this and I have no major studies to look at on iron just because that was actually a really weird one to research on what the research shows for um, iron deficiency and healing. Um, but I mean, logically think about it. If you're iron deficient and you're anemic, you have one, you have less blood flow, less oxygen getting the tissues. And so nutrient delivery is a lot lower. Two, Iron is also really important for the mitochondria to function normally. A lot of our healing involves the mitochondria. And so if the mitochondria is not functioning normally, our healing can be deficient. So these are my, what I look at for optimal lab values for iron. Okay, so we'll talk about them briefly because I think uh, I've had way too many patients walk in with a ferritin of like 20 and they're like, my doctor said I'm fine and they're fatigued, and they're pale, and they just don't feel well, they're not healing, and you start them on some form of iron repletion and it just makes a world of a difference. So, the things that I look at, I run all of these, TIBC, <coughs> ferritin, serum iron, and percent saturation, mainly because in order to get percent saturation, you need the TIBC, if I didn't need the TIBC, I probably wouldn't run it because usually that doesn't change what I'm gonna do ever because it falls in line with everything else that we see. So you, mainly I'm looking at ferritin and percent saturation, okay? Even serum iron, I don't look at as heavily as ferritin and percent saturation. At the end of the day, what's really important is the ratios, okay? If ferritin's super high, and transferrin saturation is really low, that means that the body is moving iron into the liver because of inflammation. Whether that's an infection, uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, or um, inflammation from like rheumatoid arthritis or something else like that. Ferritin is a, um, an acute phase reactant, which means it goes up in inflammation, okay? If Ferritin's low and percent saturation is low, that's iron deficiency. Whether or not it is full-blown anemia, because remember, these are hills, not cliffs. You don't have a ferritin of, where's my ferritin at? A male doesn't have a ferritin of 38, and then all of a sudden he hits 37, and he's anemic. It's a, it's a, it's a gradual transition, okay? So ferritin, men looking at around 100 nanograms per milliliter, women 80 to 100. It seems that they tend to do better with a little bit lower levels than men. Percent saturation, 35 to 40% for men and 35% for women. Okay, those are the big things that I look at. When I start to see 
transferrin saturation below 28 and 25 percent, I really start to think, are they subclinically deficient in iron? Again, as long as ferritin matches up, right? If ferritin is also on the low end, you know, ferritin is 80 or 60 or could even be worse, then it's like, okay, we need to look into different ways to increase iron status because that's going to be beneficial for the healing, okay? Thank you.